Our lesson this morning is from the 13th chapter of Hebrews. Listen now to the word of God. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured, as though you yourself were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the word of the Lord. You know, I've known some of you folks who, who 
we've heard so much about the virtue of agape love, of that sacrificial love, that they almost feel like it's wrong to accept love as well. You know, some folks love to serve, but have trouble being served. And yet it's difficult to have mutual love if we can't accept love as well. So it is that building point, though, that mutual love, that the other four things that this writer talks about, it's in that spirit of that mutual love that those things take place. The next thing he mentions is hospitality. He says in verse 2, do not neglect to show hospitality for straight to strangers, for by doing that, some of their attained angels without knowing it. Hospitality is a virtue and a gift that, that isn't really celebrated as much anymore. But in that context, it was very, very necessary. You know, if you were going to visit some other town, you didn't want to stay in an inn if at all possible. Inns at this time were tremendously expensive and not very nice. Inns were built for those folks who had money, but also didn't have anyone who liked them enough or like a family member of theirs enough to take them in for a night. You wanted to avoid an inn at all costs. And it's kind of amusing because that's not our context now. I love staying in a hotel. I love being able to go to a hotel, this room that's been cleaned just for me, especially if I'm just staying one night, because then I can be as messy as I want to be. I can do whatever I want. I can put my clothes around. I don't have to worry about like, rinsing out like the sink after I shaved. There was one time, and I'm not saying I'm proud of this, but there was one time I was staying in this hotel room, and there were two beds. And so I, I ordered out, and I got a pizza and a two-liter uh, thing of soda. And so I'm eating on a bed because, you know, where else are you going to be in a hotel? And somehow, uh, that two-liter soda that had, had been perfectly balancing on this bed no longer balanced anymore. And it just knocked over and spilled everywhere. And I should have been more upset, but I guess really all I thought was, oh, well, ball of your bed. I got a whole other bed here that's still perfectly clean. But then I did, I was like, housekeeping, somehow soda got on this bed. Just thought you should know. I mean, now we have used the hotel. But at that time, you would never want to stay in the inn. You'd want to stay with someone if you could. And the author is encouraging us, show hospitality to people. Because in doing that, some of you have entertained angels without knowing it. And he's making an allusion back to the different time that Abraham and Lot entertained angels who just seemed like normal people, and only later did they find out that they were showing hospitality to God's messengers. But as I say, hospitality, it's, it's not celebrated like it used to be. And I think it should be. I think that hospitality is a tremendous spiritual gift. You know, there's a family that I always call my adopted parents back uh, in my home church. And whenever I go home, I always visit them as well. And one day I was visiting them, and Patsy, the mom, was talking about how she just doesn't have any spiritual gifts, and she wished she had some gift. It seems like God's giving gifts to everybody but her. Meanwhile, I'm sitting in her rec on her recliner with a plate of cookies in my lap and a glass of milk. She's brewing a fresh pot of sweet tea for me, and it already a serving of dinner from what they had had that evening. She has the gift of hospitality because when you're at her house, you feel like you're home. I think a lot of us here have been that gift of hospitality. And we should welcome people into our homes. We also should do all that we can to make our church community feel like home. That's an amazing thing to be able to step outside of your home be so comfortable someplace that that place also feels like home. I think we have a pretty welcoming church. And I think that's because a lot of you do have that gift of hospitality. But let's continue to grow in that. <laughs> show hospitality to others so that when folks come to our midst, they in many ways feel like they're coming home. The third thing that the author talks about is to look out for people when they're in trouble. To provide for people when they're in need. In verse 3, he says, Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourself were being tortured. <laughs> At this time, Christians were being put in jail for their faith. Christians were being tortured for their faith. And so the author says, 
when those folks are in prison, think about it as if it were you. And whatever you would want to be done, do that for them. I mean, that's a, a golden rule kind of thing right there. At this time, a lot of times if someone was put in jail, they were confined, but they didn't have food provided for them. Someone didn't take care of their needs. And so if you wanted your fellow Christian to eat, you provided that food for them. And he's saying, take care of them. The same way that if you were in their position, you would wish someone would take care of you. There's this uh, pagan orator named Aristides who wrote in the uh, second century, very early second century, if the Christians hear that any one of their number is in prison or in distress for the sake of their heart's name, they all render aid in his necessity, and if he can be redeemed, they set him free. Redeemed means if you can raise money to free him from prison, they would do it. There are tales of people selling so much of what they have to be able to get their fellow Christian out of prison. There's even tales of people selling themselves into slavery, more like indentured servitude, for a certain period of time in order to raise money to get another Christian out of jail. That was the community that they had, that their relationship with one another meant so much that they were willing to give up their personal freedom so that someone else could get out of jail, could stop being tortured, could come and rejoin their community again. Now those sorts of things don't happen now. It's not, it's not as easy to bribe an official to get someone out of jail anymore. Uh, at least, I hope it's not. But, there's still ways that this applies to us. When your fellow Christian brother or sister is in trouble, we should do whatever it is we have to do to help them. We should be willing to sacrifice things for our own even to be able to do that because of that mutual love that we share in community. The fourth thing that is a hallmark of Christian community and Christian living is purity. He writes in particular purity in marriage. In the fourth verse, the author writes, Let marriage be held in honor by all. And let the marriage bed be kept undefiled, for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Now, I'm not married. So, this makes me an expert on how easy marriage is. <laughs> Christian community and Christian living is to learn to be content with 
with what you have. He writes in verse 5, Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Probably the most misquoted Bible verses when people say that money is the root of all evil. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And here the author of Hebrews is saying, keep yourselves from loving money. Learn to be content with what you have. And the reason he gives for that is because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Which means, I'm your security. I'm the one that you rely on. Not your money. Now money isn't a bad thing. Money is a necessary thing. How else? They had to have money to be able to liberate their fellow Christians from prison. They had to have money to be used appropriately to help people. Money isn't evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Because if you love money, it's really hard to love God. That's what Jesus said at least. He said, no one can serve two masters. You either love money or you love God. You're going to love one and hate the other. Because whatever your security is, that's your salvation. If money is your security, then ultimately it doesn't matter whether Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Because you have your money to protect you. You have your money to help you. Once again, it's not money that's a problem. It's, it's the love of money. Because if you love money, you'll never have enough. If you love possessions, then you'll never own enough. There will always be this, this rat race of trying to accumulate one more thing and one more thing as if you just, just if I could have this, then I would be happy. And yet sometimes it seems like the happiest folks are those who have the least but have just learned how to be content. Have learned that God is the source of that God is the source of their happiness. That's the power of giving, by the way. That's why, in a lot of ways, it feels so good to give. Because you're declaring who your God is. You're just saying, money's not my God. Money doesn't control me. I can use this, though. I can let God use this to bless others. Because God, God is my security. God is the one who will never leave me or forsake me. Because tomorrow the market could crash and you could lose everything you own. Tomorrow, something strange could happen and almost all of our money exists in a computer in ones and zeros and some magical balance. And if that's all wiped out, then we have nothing. And yet God is the one who will never leave us nor forsake us. Because as the author of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think it's appropriate that we hear this message while we worship here in the historic white church. This, this place that's been in this community for so long, a place that our church now is descended from, and many of you have ancestors who worshipped here. And that's a testament of the Christian community. The way those folks lived out their lives, the way that they worshipped God, the way that they conducted their faith, Talk about the good old days. Sometimes I think people are the same yesterday, today, and forever as well. But there are ways. I think the folks here lived out our faith, their faith, in ways that we could and should as well. In verse 16, the author of Hebrews says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. We should all seek and strive to live lives that are pleasing to God. To let that mutual love for one another grow. To show hospitality. To look out for our Christian brothers and sisters when they're in trouble. To focus on purity. And to learn to be 